Hey, Kendall. Hey, Gavin. You stay. I go. No following. But, Gavin, you can choose what you want to be. Welcome back with a retro review from your favorite podcast hosts that are not monetized. Oh my gosh, we're getting into classic BAM, you know, classic Kendall and Gavin content, reviewing classic movies. Stuff that's been out for, speaking about things that have been out for well over 20 years. That's us. Timely as always. But first, before yeah, we right. get into the topic, I think there's one important question that needs to be asked. Kendall, have you seen anything good recently? Um, to be fair, I have not watched a lot recently, um, other than uh, re-watching a couple times um, Society of the Snow. <laughs> but um, no, I haven't watched a lot of movies. I did re-watch Orange is the New Black. Because I never actually finished that show like the last couple seasons, so I did that after I did my Breaking Bad rewatch. But um, that's about it. Mm-hmm. How about you? Oh, uh, well, anything I've, more exciting? I started and completed My Name Is Earl since we last spoke. Uh, my main thing has just been watching lots of dropouts. So Game Changers, they have a new show called Smarty Pants, mm-hmm. where they basically just give PowerPoint presentations in front of people. I learned a lot. Amazing. Uh, like there's no such thing as vegetables. Oh, interesting. And which cryptid is the chillest to blaze with? Shout out Jacob Weissach. Who is it? Who, uh, who is it? It's Bigfoot. Oh, no, no, that, that tracks. <laughs> that tracks. <laughs> but that's most of Super what I've been watching. There. Aside from nice. D&D shows. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. You know what they say. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is true. And uh, that brings us to our classic topic of conversation uh, this week, because it's not broken and we shouldn't fix it, and yet we will probably talk about remakes. But you have to. We're going to talk about a movie that, until earlier this week, I don't think I'd seen in uh, like eighteen years. So I love this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I think oh, about it's it a very constantly. Good movie. The only Uh, reason I haven't seen it recently is because our VHS player no longer works and I don't live at my parents where said VHS is, so. Well, I upgraded to the DVD because I'm a modern person and not a cave person. Wow. Sorry that I don't just (laughs) buy all the DVDs. We are, of course, speaking of 1999 classic, The Iron Giant. Ooh, Hold for applause. Nostalgia. <laughs> I um, it, I used to yeah, watch this movie a ton as a kid. Yeah, me uh, too. I remember recently re- when I realized it was directed by Brad Bird, who also did The Incredibles. Mm-hmm. Probably. I was gonna say it looks um the the main uh villain guy whose name I'm going to blank, Manly or Mansley or whatever, looks like, looks like, um, he looks like Syndrome from The Incredibles. Oh my God, he totally does. Yeah. Um, and then, and then kind of Hogarth kind of looks like Dash. Like I can see a similar style for sure. There's definitely some pretty clear, like when you sort of compare designs and things, there's uh, some definite similarities yeah yeah so you can see where um where brad bird got some of his ideas later on yeah just some background on the iron giant as we said it's directed by brad bird it stars wait for this stacked cast stars jennifer aniston pl- playing um hogarth's mom she's probably the uh, biggest second one of the biggest stars in this movie at the time Exactly. Well, I mean, pretty soon after Friends. Well, this is during Friends because this is ninety nine. So Friends, this would be during. True. This would have been released at like the height of Friends popularity. And that well, and they would have recorded it, you know. But yeah. Before um, Vin Diesel as the giant, 
Uh, we got Harry Connick Jr., Christopher McDonald, John Mahoney. Um, and you, thinking pretty... thinking about it, like, at the time, that's actually, I mean, if you were a fan of TV and movies as we are, this is a stacked cast. But even putting it in the context of 1999, there's Jennifer Aniston mm-hmm. at the height of Friends, John Mahoney, who's the dad from Frasier, Shooter mm-hmm. McGavin, Christopher McDonald is Shooter McGavin from Happy Gilmore. So, like, three You've huge pretty... names. And, yeah. you know, I don't know how big and Harry Connick like Jr. Really was at the to... time. And Vin yeah. Diesel was not that popular at the time But it's either. also, like, it's not like they really needed to headline this as much because it's Warner Bros. And, which I totally forgot about. But maybe they did a little bit because I believe this is right after Warner Bros. merged or became Warner Bros. after it was Warner Media with um, Tur- Turner, whatever. Um, so maybe they had to headline it a little bit. But I feel like, I don't know. I feel like they wouldn't have. But well, I, I, will, I will say this about episode. Warner Animation, at least back then from what I sort of know around like Animaniacs and Batman the Animated Series and those types of shows, they don't tend to, at least in this time period, they didn't really like stunt or stack casts intentionally like that. You know, like you have Mark Hamill, who was the Joker on Batman the Animated Series, but that was not like a stunt casting thing. It wasn't as, it wasn't one of those things where it's like, oh, we're getting this big name to put in our movie. Like it would be now, like if Iron Giant came out now, obviously the cast would be like, oh my God, Vin Diesel, oh my God, Jennifer Aniston, and Hogarth would be voiced by probably Finn Wolfhard. <laughs> or... I think he's past his peak of young children because he's definitely hit puberty, but... <laughs> Still, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no, the idea, yeah, yeah, the idea is the same. But yeah, so I'm actually curious why, if if they felt a need to do that or not generally so so it's actually adapted from a story called the iron man a children's story in five nights i've never read it it's by ted hughes who was a partner of sylvia plath at one point um and the reason they changed it from the iron man to the iron giant is because they didn't want people to confuse it with marvel's iron man which is smart yeah (laughs) (laughs) on their (laughs) from (laughs) But that, yeah, that's why they called it the Iron Giant. Yeah, generally, generally, it's a big anti. I think you mean giant it's big allegory for ha, allegory <laughs> propaganda for the Cold War. Not really propaganda, I guess, if it's like you know, forty years later. But <laughs> but it's definitely like well, it's also it's set during the Cold War as well. It's set in like the fifty. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's also so where it gets all that. And this, the, I I believe the original book was also written around that time, if not the early 60s. But, so it's got a big allegory for the Cold War, specifically when it comes to Sputnik. There's a lot of talk about Sputnik and Oh yeah, so um, this would have had, space to, race. takes place in probably early 60s, because we hadn't launched yet. And no, Sputnik was in the Sputnik. air, and everybody knew about it, and they were freaking out. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah. So it's got, I mean, whether or not, I mean, I don't think many kids in the 90s, at least young audiences, were learning about the Cold War yet. Maybe if you're in, like, middle school, you would learn about it. But so when it came out for the audience that it was made for, it, it's probably not very obvious that it's based in history. But if you're an adult, it's very obvious. I mean, there's like a newspaper right at the beginning that talks about it. Um, they're all talking about Sputnik. Um, there's literally the duck and cover oh my gosh. spoof song. I think about that song, I'd say a dozen times a week. <laughs> it's been have you permanently any ingrained of the, like, original into Disney my brain. Cartoon like ads. I have not. Not really. They're just as wild. But like real. it is fully ingrained in my memory until forever. I'll be on my deathbed singing, hands over your head, down to the ground. Learn to duck and cover, the bombs are coming down. Duck and cover, <laughs> duck and cover. And the iconic image yeah. of a little bomb tapping on her desk, blowing up everything. 
Except for just a little God. spire of rock with her under her desk. Yeah, because the desk is really going to save you from an animal. Well, if she ducked and covered, it's unstoppable. <laughs> More unstoppable than a lead-lined refrigerator in an Indiana Jones movie. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, the film also has some really great like anti-gun themes and like sort of anti-conspiracy themes because Mansley is like the bad guy, but they don't actually like they don't actually like. Um, make any big statements about like the military or anything which is i mean it's you know, definitely it's i wouldn't call it yeah because it's not really anti-military so much it's more like you're saying like anti-gun and anti yeah. the military is just kind of there and i mean the general is you know seen as the positive guy um he's not, i wouldn't necessarily say he's a positive figure but he's definitely more because stable. he stops the bomb before man's or the missile before man's he's more <laughs> you know, reasonable like, for sure thing. I More think reasonable. Mansley represents a portion of the population that, I mean, you could extrapolate it to certain things going on in our today's political climate, but just like change mm -hmm. is scary and something different is happening and you got to attack things that are different and scary. Otherwise, fun fact, um, they had about a $70 million budget, which I think was mostly due to the CGI Mm -hmm. and and how many hours it takes to hand draw stuff um however they kind of got pretty low numbers in the box office it was only about 23 million but the speculated reason for this is that it literally came out the same day as the sixth sense so people kind of had to pick and choose <laughs> that's like m night Shyamalan at the height of his m night shamalan yeah. Where everybody loved those twists and like right after Unbreakable and things uh -huh. like that. Well, and it's kind of hard to pick and choose too because it, it is geared for like a younger audience because it's like an animated cartoon and it's about a kid. And so then, but then you can imagine a lot of like middle school and up wanting to go see like The Sixth Sense and yeah. see a, a cooler movie. I'm not a baby. The Iron Giant is the coolest movie. It's way better than The Sixth Sense. Eat my farts, Bruce Willis. And I'm not Sean <laughs> It's definitely timeless. Um, it's meant for all ages again. I mean, it's got plenty of thing, plenty of themes that work for um, adults as well as any age. And it's, I mean, even though it's animated and it features a kid, like it's, Again, it's it's like one any of those animated movies that has like not so much like this one doesn't so much have like inside jokes, but it has content for adults, like all the little like red scare like Well, I think what this does that a lot of good animated movies do and movies animated movies that stand up to time like this, um things like Spider Verse, th anything that holds up still from like the nineties and past or anything that stands the test of time it is made for it has a general target audience of being for children being like animated oh there's a cool robot oh hey the kid's a main character hey i'm a kid but also having you know other ingrained things like the newspaper the red scare hands over your head because like if you don't know anything about that it's just a fun silly little song it's like oh ha 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 the bomb's coming right. down and you, you don't really think about it until later and like oh because nuclear warfare and you don't even realize too like how dark it is like that song i mean like ads from that time is so catchy and so like happy and lighthearted. but it's talking about something really dark and i mean same with like other moments in the story like there's a lot of you know the whole like it's really aggressive when mansley is like accosting hogarth in the diner and like just generally like <laughs> he basically kidnap i mean he does kidnap him but um you don't as a kid you might not realize how dark some of that stuff is yes it's also interesting because it has an interesting dynamic in it where like it's just hogarth and his mom there's no mention of a mm -hmm. dad but they also are renting out a spare room because they have this there big is house. actually we see a photo of his dad on his nightstand was he in the military and he's he's like a pilot so it's oh, so yeah. you can there's no You're like right. i mean i'm sure somewhere there's like you know someone has made a huge in-depth whatever analysis but you could you could assume that either he's serving currently and that's probably why they're renting out that spare room um or he 
passed, you know, he passed away while serving since it is in a very, I think military eventful. You know what? <laughs> it probably is that he's passed away because she sort of gets together with Dean. She does. Lee well, and Arctic. there's a whole, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you can tell that Hogarth is like trying to find like a male figurehead. Um, there's just like the comparison between his interactions with Mansley and then his interactions with Dean. And then like when he says, I miss him to about the giant, it's almost like, you know, he's talking about his death. Like, you know, there's a lot of comparisons you could make that. And I mean, the, the, both st the original book and Bird's interpretation of it, they're both about grief. And so it, it kind of makes sense that that would be part of it as well. Something I mentioned a little further in our notes, but part of uh, Brad Bird's inspiration was because his sister-in-law? I think it was just his sister. So because his sister was killed by her estranged husband with a gun, sort of that extra mm -hmm. layer of grief and warning and all these things. So it's, I, it's, it's still good. I think it holds up. I really like Dean. He's a very interesting. He's a very different type of like male character because I feel like you get a lot of Mansleys, and they're sort of the hero, and they have that like, will they, won't they sort of friction dynamic. But she doesn't really have that with Mansley, thankfully, because Mansley's a creep. But you know, Dean's just like, hey man, I just make art and I work in a junkyard and I'm having a good time. Right. It is well. It does have that classic like I don't know. I feel like early. 2000s and story where it's like a single mom with like a kid and then there is that like side plot of like who's the stepdad gonna be <laughs> you know mm -hmm. similarly to brad bird's pitch um ted hughes who wrote the original story the iron man um he he wrote the story to help his children uh grieve their mom so it was like you know it it works on a lot of levels and then the of course the inevitable conversation should it be remade I think no. I think you probably could make a decent remake live action of this. However, I think the only thing you really want to see from this is a giant iron giant robot. And I saw that True. in Ready Player One. So I feel well, and satisfied. The question is like I because of like costs and whatever, you could assume that they would just CGI the robot again. Which is like, okay, that's fine, that's kind of boring imagine if it was a practical or they had practicals for it it would be so cool but no one would want to pay that money i don't know i mean admittedly his design is a little specific just because he has like really skinny limbs but you know you could just put someone in like a chest suit put their arms in legs and then just mm. green screen between and then that's yeah. really a majority of your moving parts i would say i i would when I think of practicals, I think most of the practicals would be, like, for up-close shots where, like, Hogarth is in his hand or, like, um... Oh, sure, that picking, too. You know, like, if you had a practical, uh, little parts of it that were practical, you know? Yeah, back to remakes. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this is one that someone tries to remake just to kind of bring it back to the new audiences like we talked about last week with a bunch of remakes and revivals i would be however i would be worried that it would get ruined like most remakes you know like i think it it depends on two things like do you keep it do you keep it in the original 60s time period and continue with the red scare or do you modernize it and bring it up to not necessarily present like 20s but more like oh oh what i would 2001 yeah. set it in 2001 that's a more recent and relevant example Ooh, like post it wouldn't be around in 1999 yeah, post centennial like so if you were going to remake it i think you could set it in like post 9 11 sometime and you know maybe the kid is probably not a white kid mm -hmm. you know maybe he's like muslim or something i don't know but I think if you're going to modernize it, I don't think you do Red Scare because I feel like at the time that was a really good example of it. I think you do bring it up to 2000s and have, you know, the war on terror, so to speak. Well, and, and I feel like it translates pretty I, well. That, that could be really interesting for sure. I would also 
be interested because it ends the way it ends i would rather like a sequel where it is you know you could say that he gets frozen in the arctic until global warming melts him down ooh, and then it could be more you know like it's just the same giant with a different story or with a different character yeah i think that's i don't know i think it's not a bad idea i just think it cheapens the ending Gavin of the original hates my ideas that's fine it's not that i hate <laughs> your ideas it's that i don't want that movie to be ruined mm. and i think changing that specifically i also don't think it would work in the 2020s well no i mean specifically because smartphones and no 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 i mean i think you would still i think it would still be i think it like like you were saying if it was like 2001 ish era but it is still the same giant more or less you know like oh yeah sure that wouldn't necessarily be bad maybe more like i think in that route i would maybe do more like a slightly adjusted universe where he just like crashes on the north pole and then freezes and then is defrosted in the two thousands or whatever. That's what and I said. Comes out. I'm saying something different. <laughs> You're saying like a continuation. I'm saying that the first movie like doesn't happen. Oh. And this is more like what if he crashed there instead of seeing Hogarth. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. I feel like it would get confused you know, with that the way you're like, for the first one, but maybe I don't know. Eh, that's maybe fair. not. That's very fair. Um, fun fact for the. But, but again, that's why I'm team. You know, just make yeah, a new or one. just don't make or just or if you're gonna make a new just one, make just new stories. Just don't worry about Hogarth. <laughs> just make new stories. Leave classics as they are. Um. Anyways, this movie specifically though was really interesting for its time, but also um was a great transition between like pre-2000s and into the 2000s for animation but it's it's a combination of analog and digital animation because of the nature of the giant and i don't know all the details of this i just looked up the very basics so i could briefly talk about it but the giant itself is computer generated um mostly because they needed to be able to make it like flow smoothly while still being like not a pliable object if that makes sense because it's not pliable like human skin or whatever um and they ended up having mm -hmm. to make like their own plugins and whatnot to make this work but the giant itself is cgi and the rest of it is hand drawn which is this weird hybrid of animation and it was the first traditionally animated feature to have a, a feature character that is fully computer generated especially the title character but there was an interesting article that i didn't read the whole thing of but you could look it up it's it was written by christian jared robinson on animation studio studies animation studies um a website that talks about this like transition period um that the iron giant like symbolizes of that traditional animation into a more digitized animation as the century like progressed from the 90s into the 2000s which is pretty interesting especially if you're into animation go check that out i'll try and link it if i can find the article again in the <laughs> description i'm more interested skipping ahead sorry i, I just saw this trivia as like it was originally going to be a musical. Yeah. Another hilarious slash awesome remake of this. Right. Why can't we bring that back? So before Bird was in on it, Pete Townsend of The Who pitched a rock musical about the Iron Giant, like the 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 Iron Man, um, like basing it off of the story, the book story. He was like, I want to write a rock musical, kind of like um, Tommy and he was like a good story for this would be the iron man which is which is actually a decent idea especially because the original story focuses more on the robot and then there's a whole like space war with a weird dinosaur thingy alien thingy you can look into it <laughs> so he pitched a musical a rock musical there's actually a full or partial album of it i don't know if it's publicly accessible and it did get performed like once in england <laughs> Not like, like off, you know, not West End, but like it is out there. There is a script out there. Um, so, you know, Pete Townsend sent Heck it yeah. to us and we can uh, work on um, 
getting it getting it back getting it back up finally it also also the thing before, we've all been waiting for also before brad bird was set to direct it originally don bluth was going to direct it and he directed all dogs go to heaven anastasia um the secrets Ooh, of nim or whatever that one's called so he was originally going to be the director until brad bird and the merger happened so very That's interesting cool. another interesting aspect that bird brought into it is that he re- he really wanted like he pitched it originally as a widescreen cinemascope format and no one wanted to because they're like that's just really hard especially for animation but they did eventually do that and the reason he pitched it so hard is because a lot of late 50s films were in that widescreen format so he was like i want it to be similar. got a minute yeah in. yeah which you know turned out great and they let him do it too so <laughs> clearly they agreed with him looking eventually. at some of these other people that could have been the giant i know i gotta say they really made the right call <laughs> You know, Peter Cullen, most popular voice of Optimus Prime. Mm -hmm. That's why I would say not a fan of that. Sean Connery, very obvious no. You know, I don't care how cool you are. You're not, no. Uh, Frank Welker, uh, obviously a great choice. I love Frank Welker. I just don't think he could have done as good a job. James Earl Jones, that's just Darth Vader. Right. It's like, it's... It's not the same. It's interesting, though, that, like, James Earl Jones and Peter Cullen had been robots before or were continuing to be robots which is i can understand why they were considered to right the the interesting thing for the giant though is that he doesn't speak a lot and here's a fun fact that um i learned off of imdb that outside of yells and groaning the giant only says 53 english words i mean that tracks he doesn't say much much. so it is interesting I how wonder much... if you broke it down to how many individual words he I says. I think it is individual word. Or no, I think it's not like, like no. I mean, so like, not. I'm not talking about lines. I'm saying like, just like how many times he says because he says like Superman, gun. Like how many different words he says. I think no. I think it's 53 you know words I mean? total, even the repeats. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying exclude repeats. Take those out of here. I wonder how many words. It oh, is. it's probably a lot less. Yeah. I would just be but curious. it is really interesting the casting for it because not only does it the giant not speak a lot it's also just heavily manipulated too because it's like all mechanical and whatnot but i also wonder how manipulated it is i'm sure it is a little because mechanical but also i mean vin diesel has his very distinctive voice that's true i don't know i'd be curious you quote this all the time. I remember you quoting it while we were recording once, and I don't know if that actually made it into an episode, but <laughs> uh, I, I do like... Which one? I don't I don't know. I don't even remember what you quoted. It might have been I Stay, You Go, honestly. One that I do a lot is uh, right after the giant splashes down and there's all the water and Dean is on his chair and he's like, you're right in the middle of the road! Yeah? Okay. All right. <laughs> There's also the other one. Oh, the other one about food. Like, what does Mansley say about like this is why you shouldn't. This is why it's very important chew to your chew. Food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think "squirrel up my pants" Hogarth yeah. is like a really good quote to be taken Squirrels out of context. Squirrel up my pants, man. <laughs> Squirrel, it's up my pants, man. <laughs> my other favorite is when they're going through the distinction between what's junk and art, and he says, "There's two piles." There's junk, and there's art. You can eat all the junk you want. What you currently have in your mouth is art. I love Dean. It's actually not bad. So iconic. And you know, as we've said, movie will stand the test of time, I believe. It's still very good. It is, you mentioned Treasure Planet and Atlantis. It definitely has that, like, under-the-radar very good movie tone to it and i think because like atlantis and treasure planet it's sort of in that transitionary period it's, and well it those are both i just of, looked them up that was 2001 and also, 2002 so they were both like right in that early transition and i think they're just overshadowed by more popular movies A at the lot time of disney movies which is the <laughs> other i mean <laughs> they were supposed to be like the big disney movie but they didn't really catch yeah as much as they were supposed Disney to classics, whatever. but they're still very good but i mean even that'd be a good like 
movie night is Atlanta's Treasure Planet and the Iron Giant. Yeah. Giants. Even though, like, classic Disney movies or whatever, or older animated movies, you can sometimes see, like, the quality. You see the quality and you're like, oh, it's not as good as today, which, like, you know, everyone's always going to say that about, it, about anything because, yeah, our technology has improved. But even still, the quality in this, in the Iron Giant, is still really good. Like, it holds up really well. And I think part of that is to the fact that they have a hybrid of CGI and analog, you know. Well, I think the other thing that makes older animation not look, quote unquote, as good as current animation is it's done digitally versus by yeah. hand. And, you know, you can have a lot smoother transitions and you can you know animate much smoother digitally than you can it's also easier to copy frames and and um repeat frames than having to actually it, it's faster too like <laughs> than having to hand draw the same however that is not to take away from uh the difficulty of animating in today's oh yeah world. no yeah it's still hard as hell especially because now the focus has shifted it's not just how quickly and how fast you can animate these things that you have to include all these extra details like you know doing all of merida's hair mm -hmm, from brave mm -hmm. and each one has its own little strand and stuff like that and you have to make sure all these specific details are you know look really really good yeah yeah other than other than like reminding me of kind of like early 2000s like treasure planet and atlantis other ones it reminds me of, but this is more in, like, storyline, is, like, Lilo and Stitch, E.T., and kind oh, of Super 8. so good. But, you know, it, especially Lilo and Stitch, you know, like... I can see why you were, get Super 8. Yeah, alien crashing, FBI coming in and being like... Rah, 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 rah. I didn't even think about Lilo and Stitch. That is actually a really good comparison. Lilo and Stitch is another one of my favorites. It is, yeah. It's a good one. Classic. obviously i have a cat named <laughs> who's currently being a menace and i kind of want to punch him in the face but yeah that, that kind of reminds me fine. of those stories and it's almost like if you were well et and super 8 are live action so it's almost like you don't need a live like if uh, going back to like live action remake like you, you don't need a live action because you have other stories that are live action that are very very similar and i think as i already kind of mentioned if you're going to tell in a live action don't tell that 60s story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, bring it up to something more speak. relevant. Um, a couple comments. One, who in the freaking world names their kid Hogarth? Um, but fun fact. Grandpa named Hogarth. Fun fact. Day. Hogarth and his mom's last name, Hughes, is an homage to the original writer, Ted Hughes, who actually passed away in 1998 before the movie was made. So... so I have last a question name is to great, pose to you. Who in the heck names their kid Hogarth? <laughs> uh, so this is one of my favorite Vin Diesel roles. Uh -huh. Could you guess what my favorite Vin Diesel role is? And it is not from Fast and the is Furious. Is it the one that you literally listed on here earlier? Did I? I it was on here earlier. The yeah, the pacifier. <laughs> the pacifier is yeah, iconic, only because... and we should probably talk about that someday. <laughs> We'll do like a Vin Diesel month or something. Yeah, or we could just do, you could just do we'll a just Vin do a bunch Diesel, of Vin Diesel episodes. <laughs> and the only thing that makes Vin Diesel in The Pacifier better than Vin Diesel in Iron Giant is because he shouts at a little girl that uh, his bulbous pecs are not boobs. <laughs> so iconic. <laughs> They're not boobs. So iconic. Oh, man. Also, we just get to see how ripped he is, you know. True. And he's only gotten more yep. ripped. Um, I also think that, and no one steal my idea. Um, so if I see this next Halloween, I know you're going to have stolen it from me. But if you were like super tall, even if you weren't super tall, um, and you had like a kid, like a toddler, a Hogarth and Iron Giant costume pairing would be so perfect. Honestly, just getting like a cool, like a basic action figure or something and then just going and as the giant the would little be pretty figure cool. around. Yeah, that could work too. Just like put it on your shoulder. That'd be pretty good. I see you posed a relevant topic. I did. In regards we to could this. do a random one as well, but this is what I thought. Who would I cast? Who or who would you cast in a live action remake? Because we t had it so much in our notes, I was like, mm, we should think about this. Um, so Vin Diesel still the giant. Vin Diesel still the giant. So there was one line, like Has there's one be. part where Mansley calls Dean Beatnik. And immediately it just made me think of um, 
uh, <laughs> of um, God fucking I hate everything. My brain is blanking. Norman Reedus. Oh my fucking god. Huge huge brain freeze. So they called him Beatnik, and I and they called him Beatnik, and he and Norman Reedus when he was like twenty was in a movie about the Beatniks, which is like was like the poetry music. Um, movement of the 50s <laughs> and he, I don't know if it would work as well now because he's not as young obviously but I could see him playing like the middle of the middle of the country like guy living living being artsy in a scrapyard but also if you wanted a younger person to play my submission for Dean. not like a main character just someone to be in the movie would be Paul Walter Hauser ooh I just think he'd be good in the movie somewhere. He doesn't have to be a main character. I just kind of want him to be there. Let's see. Who'd be another good one? Who would um, be good? But I could also see, like, Iron maybe Oscar Isaac to play Dean. Oh. Um, I as got like one a younger... for you. This might be a little weird. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Cox is Dean. Oh, interesting. Um, I have an idea for who would play Hogarth, although it would have to be now while he's still kind of young, but... <laughs> Jacob Tremblay, who was in the room. No. Pass. Pass on Jacob Tremblay. But I think he's also pass I think on he's him. also past his child peak anyways. I was you have it's, to get... he's getting to be past his child peak, but you know who I think would actually be really good is uh did you see the black phone with Ethan Hawk? No. The kid from that I think would be good. I can't remember his name. Who would you cast as um the mom? You just, I wasn't thinking this, but as soon as you said it, I just thought like Marissa Tomei or Maya Rudolph Ooh, just kind of instantly. Uh -huh. I don't know why, but that's just like, when you said it, that's what I thought of immediately. His name is Mason Tens. Yeah, I saw that too. Another great child actor, although I think he's also growing up. <laughs> they all, I mean, they all are, is the kid that plays one of the twins in, um, not Scarlet Witch, what's the, one of her kids. <laughs> uh it's not is it the witch or the fast one it's the one that was also Isn't in it? um like the haunted house movie haunting, of hill, haunting house? of hill house yeah i'm pretty sure that was billy i don't know that i don't know the difference between them um but the kid's name is julian hillard hilliard although yeah he's also growing up god damn it why do kids have to grow up so fast oh he plays billy yeah wandavision my, my brain is not working Boom. today you know what this is actually when i was looking at the other one i just had another good idea for um this would be for mansley mm. would be james ransom okay aka detective so-and-so aka eddie from the new versions of it yeah yeah because i feel like he has that like he kind of can have that sort of intimidating presence but also just a little bit of a coward yeah no that would be interesting i mean those are the main characters to cast i guess so i was trying to think if there'd be like a like a good general person these days i can't think of a oh i know i already said charlie cox since i can't think of dean Ooh, jackson robert scott the kid from it the little kid like the brother which one he plays the brother oh god so it. he's still he's still in the age range <laughs> uh, it would be hard to cast you would have to cast the kid obviously when you're like ready to do it so i don't know if you could actually cast anyone that's current that's currently um working, working. but that's those are kind of like the vibes i guess of like who i would look for in a child actor i think chris evans pre captain america fame would have been a really good dean mm. If you had to choose, like, if Vin Diesel was busy and refused the project, who would you choose for the giant? Nobody. <laughs> you would just cancel the Scrap project? The whole thing. <laughs> yep. If Vin Diesel couldn't do it, I wouldn't want it. Because I don't think anybody could do as good a job. Brought, I'm sure people could do what fine. What if instead you brought Vin Diesel in as, like, the general or something? Bring him in as both. I don't give a <laughs> shit. <laughs> he can do two things, man. I don't care. That's fair. Bring in John Cena as the general. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be interesting uh, you just get all the Bring wrestler dudes to Henry play Cavill. the entire military yes that'd be awesome are you ripped. kidding it's me <laughs> it's great they look like they work out it's cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right random topic <gasps> random topic pulled fresh from the jar favorite baked good Ooh, savory or sweet it says baked good but i'm asking you savory or sweet either or um i really let's say start with savory i really like start with savory. oh 
Unless you were going to say sweet. I was going to say sweet. sweet. I really like muffins, but specifically banana chocolate chip muffins are probably my favorite. I feel like that counts as a bit of both. That Yeah. Otherwise... I think muffins are really tasty. I did just bake a loaf of sourdough mm. over the weekend for the first time. I was going to say bagels. Does that count as a baked good? That's Ooh, probably my yes. favorite savory. It's like an, a toasted yeah, everything so bagel good. with cream cheese. I like a cinnamon raisin bagel. That was mm. my favorite for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since I had one. Well, there you have it, folks. We talked giants. We talked baked goods. We talked other 90s and 2000s masterpieces, sort of. And we gave you some fun facts. I think that's all we have. Yes. Uh, Don't steal our ideas, (laughs) uh, please. Unless you want to pay us to do them, in which case you can find us on the internet. That's true. We are not hard. That's true. We are not hard to find. Make sure you like and subscribe and uh, leave a comment let us know your thoughts on the iron giant or if it's not one of your favorite classics from the 1999s or early 2000s tell us which one don't is. tell me i don't want to oh, hear okay it. you can tell me you can tell me your other favorite but if you don't like it i don't want to hear from oh, you my goodness. uh and you can find us on instagram at that bam podcast where we advertise what episodes are and also share fun memes and things memes and things things. alrighty we will catch you all next time have a bam good day bye oh my god stitch bye